Kathy Diali. Martelli has to go. Election turmoil in Haiti. Voting scheduled for today is postponed. We'll have a live report from Port-au-Prince. Florida Tax Credit Scholarship sends 78,000 kids to private and parochial schools. Is that constitutional? The state teachers union says no. A swarm of bikers cause havoc on South Florida streets and roadways on MLK Day, breaking traffic laws, defying police. Why did the cops stand down? We'll take it to the round table. Good morning and welcome. So glad you could join us this morning. It has been a hectic news week from Sarah Palin endorsing Donald Trump to those marauding bikers on Martin Luther King Day to the scheduled and then postponed presidential elections in Haiti. And that is where we begin this morning. A presidential runoff scheduled for today was delayed late this week after massive street demonstrations in Haiti and threats of violence if the elections went forward. Haiti's Electoral Council decided to hold off on voting, but President Michel Martelly's term expires February 7th. Right now, there is no one to replace him. Local 10's Glenn Moberg has been in Port-au-Prince since Friday reporting on this topsy-turvy electoral progress. Glenn joins us now live from Port-au-Prince. Glenn, good to see you. Good morning. What is the latest there from Haiti? Hi, Michael. Good morning, everyone. Well, Sunday morning standard operating procedure here is in church and there are churches around where we are right now and in the air you could hear this sort of joyful noise of prayer and worship and that was such a beautifully welcome change from this sporadic violence and sporadic mayhem that we have been seeing all over i know people have been watching these protests increasingly we learned that there are people who are paid to instigate these protests largely peaceful but some that have turned dangerous and violent and now that these protesters have gotten what they wanted aka the elections postponed today well now they have increasingly new demands the crowd both planned and spontaneous got loud at times frightening and dangerous and the demands have grown everybody they now want President Michel Martelly, the Prime Minister, and the Electoral Council to resign now that their protests have stoked enough fear of violence that the Electoral Council canceled the election. Is that empowering that technique to continue? Absolutely. It's time for the president and the prime minister to get out of the country before the 7th of February. The opposition that has coalesced from losing candidates convinced that President Martelli's government rigged the election, manipulated votes for Jovenel Moïse, a political novice who became the front runner in the runoff. The second, Jude Celestine, refused to participate. So many struggles with the process. So it's better to stop it and try to find out what's wrong. Everything is, is upside down. We are looking forward to the next coming days if there will be anything. We met young voters who look past politics to Haiti's more institutional issues. And there's a lack of education and the people that are preparing the elections. If you were like here to make people vote white and you don't even know how to vote, so this is a problem. It's in Haiti. It's like, a, it's like a lot of it. Some people are trying to win. You know, increasingly we hear that people largely view their government here as not so much as a public service, but as a way to make money. And that's why you saw 53 people run for president in the October elections. So as much as you see, Michael, this really vocal opposition, we found a lot of people who actually do support President Michel Martelly and his administration and the things that he's done in his tenure, especially younger people and business people who really buy into the building of schools and hospitals and the things that this administration has done to attract yeah. foreign investments. Um, understood, Lena, but uh, Michel Martelly's term expires February 7th. And the Constitution doesn't provide for what happens if there is not an elected successor. Uh, so how are they going to get an elected successor? 
That's the question everybody is asking here, including a lot of people that we hear were in these closed door meetings yesterday. You have a lot of stakeholders involved, not only the administration, not only this sort of mosaic of fractured opposition and all the different political parties who have come together in an opposition block, but you have the international community involved as well, the European Union, the OAS. The U.S. is involved heavily. Remember, the U.S. Uh, U.S. 33 million U.S. dollars funded the electoral process that was supposed to be in a runoff today to make sure things worked smoothly. So that's what they're trying to do today is to come to some sort of compromise that all sides can buy into. And we're hearing right now, and this may be a little breaking news, um, that the plan that they have sort of in the works, and no one's weighed in on this yet, but that there will be this transitional government that all the stakeholders can agree on to sort of smooth the way so that President Martelli can trans make that transfer of power on February 7th and then hold elections with an entirely new electoral council and an entirely new slate of this organization that puts these elections into place. So that frankly sounds like a daunting job to do in the next couple of days, but that's kind of the plan we hear is being floated at the moment. Yeah, well, daunting, I think, is, is the right word, and also just trying to get solid information. I know from personal experience, trying to get good, solid information is very hard. We're so glad you're there. We know you're working on it, and uh, be careful of the manifestation. When those uh, demonstrators get out in the streets, it can be dicey. So take care of yourself, Dan. We are. Thanks, Michael. We're keeping safe. Thank o you. Okay. Glenn and Melberg live in Port-au-Prince. Thanks. Up next, school choice and vouchers. 78,000 kids in Florida go to private and religious schools using corporate tax credit vouchers. The teachers union calls it unconstitutional. They are suing. We'll talk about it next. One of the longest running disputes in K through 12 education in Florida is over school choice. The question is basically simple. Should poor children who often attend substandard public schools get money from corporations for scholarships? They get vouchers to attend private or religious schools and the corporations get a healthy tax credit, which is money that otherwise would go into state tax coffers. Sharon Glickman is president of the Broward Teachers Union, the state teachers union of which her union is a part, is suing to put an end to the state tax credit scholarship pro program. Frederick Ingram is president of the United Teachers of Dade, one of the largest teachers union groups in the state. He is a former teacher of the year. To both of you, welcome. And let me say at the outset that we had hoped to have Bishop Victor D. Curry of New Birth Baptist Church with us to present that side of the argument. He couldn't get here uh, because of an emergency, but let's just go ahead and Fred Ingram, let me ask you, there are roughly 21,000 children in Miami-Dade County, 7,000 in Broward, who are getting these vouchers. They're going to schools, apparently pretty good schools, getting good results. And what is wrong with that? What is wrong with this voucher program? Well, we don't have any problems with the schools per se. We have a problem with the mechanism in which they are allowed to go to these schools. And so we believe that it's unconstitutional uh, to have uh, what would be public dollars go into uh, the private coffers of a church or a sectarian institute doesn't matter what it is but we believe that this is fervently uh, unconstitutional all right and Sharon Glickman the uh, the argument um, aside from separation of church and state because 80 percent of these kids go to religious schools uh, voters of Florida, I don't know how many years ago, passed a constitutional amendment that said every child in Florida is entitled to a good public education. So is this program, do you believe, that what it violates in the state constitution? Well, I think so, because the state constitution says that we have to, we have a requirement to fund public schools to adequately, yeah. and the point is these tax funds are going not to public schools and therefore we're not taking care of all of Florida's children. Well, uh, 78,000 children across the state are getting these tax vouchers and the legislature and the governor think that it is constitutional. So where does your lawsuit stand? One was 
you, you filed a FEA, Florida Education Association, filed this lawsuit last year and it was thrown out by a judge in Tallahassee. So where does it stand now? Well, where it stands is we as taxpayers, all of us, have due process, have the right to go to the courts and for them to make a decision on, on this situation. All right, and so this let issue. the courts decide is your yes, point of view. Yes, let's the, let the courts decide. Yeah. Uh, Fred Ingram, the basic philosophical question here is one that I know, I mean, you're a career educator, and, and that is school choice. Giving parents of who are not rich and can't afford a private school the opportunity to send their children to a private school as a wealthy family could. So why shouldn't they have that choice? Well, listen, we've always had that choice. We've always had parochial schools. We've always had private schools. We've always had different types of schools that parents could choose. But this is the first time in our history that we now have an opportunity for people to use public dollars into private institutions. So if I can walk back just a little bit in history, in 2006, in the Bush v. Holmes case, uh, the first opportunity scholarships, mm -hmm. the opportunity scholarships were struck down by the Supreme Court of Florida, and it was deemed unconstitutional. And this is a spinoff from uh, the legislature to enact uh, the same type of voucher system which allows corporations and companies to divert what would be tax dollars uh, in, into the, the private coffers of these institutions. Yeah, Again, money, money that otherwise would be going into absolutely. general state tax revenues, some of which would go to public education. Absolutely. And so in public education, what we need uh, to make all students better is to, uh, we need a system of fairness, we need a system of, of fair access, and we need resources. And these resources are precious and scarce. Yeah. They're well, they are precious and scarce. I mean, the money that is going to these scholarship kids is roughly $5,600 a year, which is the full-time equivalency, I guess, funding uh, mm -hmm. minus capital costs uh, for kids in the public schools, right? Correct. But if you look at the history also, we started out with $50 million of this funding going to the uh, student credit scholarship, tax mm -hmm. scholarship. Mm -hmm. And that was back in 2003. Now, uh, the funding now is about $370 million, mm. And they say by 2018, it'll be around $873 million. So all of this money that goes for all our Florida children, it's being taken out and a small group is being educated with that money when if that money goes back into the coffers of free public education we can take care of all our children with yeah. their needs. Yeah, well if Bishop Curry or someone else on the other side of the argument were here, I think that what they might say here is look, if you have a child who goes to an inner city school which has a, a, a record of getting a D grade or a C grade uh, where the, the standards are simply not as high as they are in Parkland or Pinecrest or Coral Gables, uh, why should a child not have an opportunity to go to a, a school with a higher academic level? Because the, the problem with those schools that you're saying, they don't have state accountability. How so? Uh, well, number one, uh, they do not have to take the same state test as all our children in free public schools. Uh, also, the fact is even the teacher evaluation is not the same. Uh, they dictate exactly what the curriculum is going to be, exactly the education of the teachers, uh, how large the class size is going to be as yeah. well. Well, what about, excuse me, what about academic outcomes? And eventually, uh, that, these kids have to be tested at some point and the people who support the tax credit scholarship say uh, they test on a par with students in public schools. But it's not necessarily so, and that's what the problem is. They do not have to have the Florida standards. And what are we going, we're testing children in high school to see if they have the standards mm -hmm. back in elementary school and middle school. And what I do want to mention is the, the public schools 
they're changing. It's called priority schools. And they are in these communities. Yeah. And what they're doing is they're having grade elementary all the way up to middle school, ninth grade, and even high school. And what they are supplying to these families and children is health, dental, uh, guidance, uh, also going into the home and working with the parents. Right. These are the new priority schools right. that And they also, a, a lot of these kids in, in poor neighborhoods get breakfast, lunch, yes. and an after-school mm -hmm. snack. Uh, uh, Fred, I guess uh, the major change, one of the major changes in public education in Florida particularly in the last decade or so has been charter schools. And Miami-Dade County, rather than public schools rather than fight them has tried to accommodate charter schools but we're not talking about charter schools here are we that's correct we're talking about money going to private or parochial schools that's correct well the success of charter schools has been pretty good a mixed results but uh, the Miami-Dade County School Board has really been disposed to say okay let's give it a try well listen at, at, at the end of the day, this is about public education and, and or the lack thereof. We want to make sure that we educate every child. We don't want a separatist system or two systems running uh, at the same time. We've always had these schools. We don't have a problem with the schools themselves. Parents should have those choices. If you want to send your kid to these schools, you can, but you should not be allowed to use public dollars. The yeah. public coffers are the public coffers, and that comes with a system of accountability, regulations, and a standard that is set by uh, our state government. Yeah. Well, would you say now, if a parent who lived in Overtown or Liberty City uh, was sending their child right now to one of their neighborhood schools, which has seen a lot of huge investment, I think, uh, dollars, better teachers over the last couple of years, would you say that they are now the equivalent of any of the private schools, parochial schools, these other voucher students are going to? In Miami-Dade County, we've done a yeoman's job at, 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 at making our schools much better than they were in the past. As In, in fact, uh, in many of these schools, in many of the neighborhoods that you just mentioned, uh, our schools are doing the work uh, of our, our graduation rates are the highest that they've ever been in Miami-Dade County. Uh, our elementary schools are passing the, the state exams, uh, although we don't agree with the state exams. Our, our children and our teachers are jumping all of the hoops that people have asked us yeah. to do. And, and what about uh, Sharon in Broward because you certainly have some poor neighborhoods and schools that historically had not done well on uh, uh, student achievement but they've shown improvement too. Immensely and again the quality of the teachers, okay, the dedication of the teachers, getting to more students so that they can be educated and, they, and the extra help that they need. So if anything, again, uh, the state tests that the students have to take, which we don't always agree with so many, yeah. but the fact is our children are doing much better than they've ever done before, and in the future they're going to do better. All right. Well, that's but, a good point on which to end. We're out of time, but Sharon okay. Glickman from Broward Teachers <laughs> Union, Frederick Ingram from United Teachers of Dade, great to have you come in. Thank you. Appreciate it. We'll see what the legislature does. Okay. All right. Stay with us when we come back. It will be time for the roundtable. It is time now to take a much closer look at the top stories in the news, get some expert analysis and informed opinion. From our powerhouse roundtable, we have got a good one for you this week. The redoubtable H.T. Smith is a Miami attorney, civil rights activist, professor of law at Florida International University. Our friend Rosemary O'Hara is the editorial page editor of the Sun Sentinel. That page has been paying special attention lately to the selection process for a new CEO of Broward's Memorial Healthcare System. Justin Safey is an attorney, founder, and publisher of the esteemed Safey Review, a compilation of what of some of the best and brightest are saying about politics in the state of Florida. To all of you, good morning. Great to have you come in. Great to be here. Uh, HT, we saw the report from uh, Glenna in Haiti, and you look at the situation there, as I have often over the years, you hope for the best, but this is kind of despairing to think that they're coming up on the end of a presidential term and there's nobody to succeed Michelle Martelly. Yeah, this month is the 212th anniversary of the founding of the Republic of Haiti. 
And when you look at all of the times that outside countries were running the country and then the dictators, Papa Doc and Baby Doc, mm -hmm. and then the little time that they uh, uh, had democracy, you know, we had a period of time from the exchange of power from Ber Ber Bertrand Aristide to Preval that things went kind of smoothly. Yep. Uh, the people of Haiti are good people, are hardworking people, are faith-based people. They deserve a government as good as they are, and they're not getting it. And I'm hopeful that this transitional uh, government will be put in place so that we do not have the president stay past February 7th. That is a constitutional crisis and a security crisis as well. Yeah, well said. I was there for the first election of Jean Bertrand Aristide. It was one of the most exciting periods uh, because something like 97 percent of eligible Haitians voted. They voted peacefully. They went to the polls, even illiterate people. You know, they have pictures of the candidates on the ballot, and they put their thumbprint by their person, and it was a hopeful moment, not, not so hopeful right now. I guess the only hope is that, you know, the people have spoken. This election, the runoff, was uh, nobody believes it. They don't believe these two finalists really right. won, won it. And so uh, as it was marching toward an election this week, you know, the people said, we don't trust it, start over. Right. And while it is a crisis and a constitutional crisis, the only, and, and it's so hard, it's such, such a chaotic country and a corrupt right. country, but the only good news in the whole thing is that Wow, power to the people. I, nobody likes the, you know, the the violence, but the people are going to get are going are demanding a fair election and so let's hope they get let's it. Let's hope Jimmy Carter comes on the scene. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I was there once when he oversaw the elections. I don't think Jimmy Carter is going to change much. Anyway, yeah. uh, let's move on to the state legislature and Justin Safey, you have been up in Tallahassee mm -hmm. and watching uh, the legislature at work, always uh, an amazing thing to watch. Um, the dynamic of power, how it, <laughs> how it shifts. The one thing uh, I'd like to begin with is what I thought was a courageous and gutsy move in the state Senate. Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Miguel Diaz de Lopatia of Miami, a Republican this week, stopped dead in its tracks, as it were, the campus carry bill. Wait, what a moment that yeah, must have been. Yeah, really. I mean, the, he's the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and his role, he gets to decide which bills come before the committee and which ones don't. And there is a fair amount of pressure on him as a Republican to schedule the bill, at least to ha have a hearing on it. Right. Uh, but he doesn't like the bill. This will allow for the open carry of firearms, or the carrying of firearms, rather, on college campuses, on Florida's public universities. And uh, he says, look, I didn't like the bill last year. I'm, I don't like it this year. I'm not going to schedule it for a hearing, which effectively kills the bill. Right, because it will not get to the Senate floor. The House supports that bill, but... Uh Rosemary, uh, you've editorialized yes. on this, so yes. what do you think? Uh, thank God for the Senate. You know, the Senate is being a, put in a barricade up this year. When John Thrasher was in the Senate, who's now president of Florida State, the Senate was a barrier last, the last time around. Uh, you know, the, Mary, the NRA has oversized clout in Tallahassee, right. and so it is a surprise and a delight to see finally the lawmakers say, more guns is not the answer. And, right. you know, I've never liked uh, the fact that uh, the head of a committee could have so much power. Uh, on this one, <laughs> on this one, I changed my mind. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm reminded of what a Hollywood, big time Hollywood producer, movie producer once said. He said, absolute power corrupts, uh, absolute power, uh, power tends to corrupt, absolute power is fabulous. <laughs> so for, for Miguel Diaz de la Portilla, uh, and I'm going to at the end of the show have a little attaboy for for him. But you know, um, we, st we still have stand your ground yeah. legislation moving forward. Uh, changing it so that the, the uh, burden shifts to the state. I know in the House there was a setback in a committee, mm -hmm. but it's still uh, alive. And we also still have uh, open carry of concealed firearms is still there. So right. we got to watch that very, very carefully and, and, right. and see that well, we, that comes out the right way as well. Yeah. Justin, what do you think is going to happen with open carry, which will allow people who have concealed weapons permits to openly carry their weapons with them? Well, that's going to be the next battle. Um, and I don't really have a good prediction right now. The, for, the NRA is supporting this bill very strongly. It has a fair amount of support in the, in the Senate. The House, um, you know, we'll see what happens there. But 
you know, the legislative sessions, nine weeks, it ends on March 11th. I think this is one of those issues that we could see come yeah. up to the very final weeks yeah. of the session. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, I, I think Rick Scott, and I've talked to a number of legislators before the session began, and uh, they get along with him all right, but they find him kind of irrelevant. He doesn't really speak their language. He's a CEO. He works by executive, not executive orders, but ordering things to happen. Uh -huh. and, and they just find him hard to work with. Well, and he, he, he's not in there swinging. I mean, he's jobs, jobs, jobs is his central issue, and yay for that. But there are a lot of other issues yeah. that we expect a leader of the state to deal with. Another one, and we don't have to get into it, but is the gambling compact. Yeah. I What's mean, he negotiated happen? a deal yeah. with the Seminoles, and now he's like, here, you guys, it's, you know, did my part, it's up to you. Well, having worked for a governor, I worked for Governor Jeb Bush, it's an interesting dynamic. You talk about the legislative process. It's also an interesting dynamic between the governor and the legislature. And, you know, the governor, you know, the legislature, you know, has the prerogative of the legislature. There's a famous story of Senator Dempsey Barron um, kicking Senator... Uh, Governor Lawton Childs out of the Senate chamber said, "Get the heck out of my get the heck out of my Senate." <laughs> um, so you know, there's that tension that exists. The Governor Scott, as you said, is focused on jobs, economic development, growth. That's his main issue. Tax cuts is another one. Um, and I think he'll, a lot of times he lets the legislature figure out the other issues, and then you know, lets lets his opinion be known when it's necessary, and lets them also know that he's got a veto pen if they do things that uh, that he doesn't like. All right, um, let's move on to the presidential race. We're only, what, eight days away from uh, a week from tomorrow are the Iowa caucuses. And uh, maybe I should point out, I've covered the Iowa caucuses a couple of times. It's a very curious duck. I mean, it's, it's not really a vote. People go out into their local school and uh, somebody says, all right, everybody for this candidate in that corner and everybody for the other candidate over there. Uh, it is really Americana, and it's kind of dear. It's, I mean, it's a, a beautiful moment to watch it happen. But anyway, let's talk about where things stand. There's a new poll out today. It shows Bernie Sanders at 51 percent, Hillary Clinton at 43 HT. I, I mean, this was, is not a good start for Hillary Clinton, who was up by 30 points uh, yeah. not long ago. Yeah, this is not a good a year for the people who have been involved in the political process in the past. People want change and they definitely want people who are at least giving them a promise of a totally different way of, <clears throat> of uh, governing. Iowa has an outsized effect on the process because really it is not very representative of the nation, number one. Right. Uh, people vote in a very strange way for those of us who live in places like Florida mm -hmm. to understand, but the press that will come out of it and the momentum that it will give yeah. to the winners and some people who will do much better. If you remember, this time last year, last uh, election, uh, the, the person who was second from the last wound up winning it. Uh, the uh, the Pennsylvania uh, senator, Centaurum. 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 he was second from the bottom. He wound up winning it. So people right. prognostication. This is a year that prognostications, you can throw it out of the window. Right. We don't well, know what's going to happen. The, the conventional wisdom often seems to be wrong, <laughs> and it's been wrong in this race so far. We want to talk about it more. Stay with us. Back with more of our roundtable in just a minute. Welcome back on this Sunday morning live in our studio and all-star cast for the roundtable. H.T. Smith, law professor at FIU, civil rights activist Rosemary O'Hara from the Sun Sentinel and Justin Safey, uh, who, as he said earlier, once worked was the communications director for Jeb Bush. So Jeb doesn't and will not win uh, Iowa. He doesn't have to. He can, but he has to do fairly well there. How do and the polls show him down? fourth or fifth right well you know look I uh, the pundits are saying a lot of things and the polls are saying things four years ago no one really predicted that Mitt Romney would win Iowa on caucus night they actually declared him the winner before three weeks later figuring out that Rick Santorum had beat him by 36 or 37 votes right so 
I think we have to wait and see what the voters say. The voters, thankfully, have the final word on this uh, in, in, in Iowa. But I think he'll do better than expected in Iowa. And New Hampshire, obviously, is critical. He's spending a lot of time in New Hampshire. Yeah. The, the, the campaign ads, they're airing in New Hampshire. So he's, he needs a strong finish in New Hampshire, for sure. And, and uh, Justin, let me ask you, uh, I happen to admire the work of uh, the columnist and former Reagan speechwriter Peggy Noonan mm -hmm. in the Wall Street Journal. She had a column in this weekend's Wall Street Journal uh, in, in which she said, quote, Mr. Bush uncorks witless free prefab sound bites about Donald Trump. Donald Trump is the chaos candidate. What does that even mean? What she is really calling for is for Jeb to get serious and say, here is why Donald Trump is not qualified to be president. Well, what I first of all need to note is that of all the Republican candidates, only one, Jeb Bush, is calling out Donald Trump. All the other candidates yeah, are in the witness protection. <laughs> they're in the witness protection program. They, they they don't have anything negative to say about Mr. Trump. Only when they're attacked. But I give credit to, to Governor Bush for doing that because he knows that Donald Trump is not the right person to be lead, to be the nominee for the Republican Party. Yeah. Uh, H T. As you pointed out before we went on the air, the National Review um, published uh, this week a article, a an edition, which has 22 prominent conservatives saying. No, Donald Trump, he's not the real deal. He's not a real conservative. But you say you think that's going to backfire. Yeah, I think it's going to backfire. This is the year that people are against the establishment. Uh, they, they are not for policies, programs, and position papers. They want the politicians first as the password to listen, that you feel my pain. You feel my pain about the, this administration mm -hmm. that has made me a victim and the leaders of the Republican Party who have promised and promised and not delivered. So once you show us you can feel our pain and express it with anger and passion, we'll listen to you. So those messages are not getting through. And so I think that is, if I were a Trump supporter, I would want the people who are the leaders of the party to down me and, and it, it plays right into his hand. Now, I'm a Democrat. And right now there's a civil war in the Republican Party. And I don't want to do anything to get in the way of that. <laughs> Smart so, so does all of this redound in the favor of Hillary if she can kind of get her campaign together? Oh, well, Hillary's an establishment candidate, too, and she's not lighting things on fire. And that Bernie Sanders is ahead in Iowa, and now Bloomberg is saying he might run as an independent. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God, all bets are off. Yeah. Well, all right. Well, let's, let's, I, I think this, it's interesting. There is divisions in both parties, and it, I agree with the construct that H.G. set up. It's outsider versus insider. Yeah. Bernie Sanders is, is doing well against Hillary Clinton for the same reason that Donald Trump is doing well against all the other establishment. Right. Yeah. Donald but, but, Trump and Cruz. And yeah, Cruz. I was going to say, but here's Ted Cruz, who I have read uh, in private with big money donors, says, you can trust me, Princeton, Harvard Law, you know, and then he goes outside and says, uh, I'm really an outsider. But he has been, uh, he was the Texas Solicitor General, he was the Attorney General. Uh, I mean, he has been in politics an insider all his life, even though he is not well liked in Washington and doesn't right like a lot of people there and kind of thrives on it right but that's that's what he's trying to appeal to what people want at the moment even though it's yeah. inconsistent with his record yeah all right well let's can if we can one of the highlights of the week i think politically and for anyone was sarah palin coming out to <laughs> endorse uh donald trump and gave a a talk that uh, it was just zippity doo da zippity a i mean it was uh, kind of unbelievable when you heard uh, Rosemary when you heard her get up there and in her own inevitable fashion you know kind of it was like a jazz solo I don't know what it was it was kind of fun but I'm not sure what she said. Yeah, no, and I'm not sure Donald Trump knew what she was saying either. If you watched his face in the background, right. I thought Jim Moran had a great cartoon in the in the Miami yes. Herald. You know, his one yep. frame was her talking and or him saying he was going to have surround himself with the best and brightest, and then the second frame was <laughs> you betcha. <laughs> Yeah, how's that working out for you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I also, I don't know, uh, last night I watched Saturday Night, Saturday night Live believing in, that uh, they were going to have to do something with it. And sure enough, Tina Fey showed up uh, doing Sarah Palin. But I was struck. I mean, it was good. 
but I was struck, it's hard to satirize a self-parody. <laughs> uh, and, and it was fun, but it, it didn't quite ring the bell for me. But I think it goes to what H.T. was saying before about the National Review, this conservative establishment organization trashing Donald Trump. Having Saturday Night Live make fun of you in certain parts of America is yeah. a badge of honor because yeah. those are the people of New York City and Washington, the power right. centers of the country. Right. The and snarky media. The, and the liberal elite. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. in some cer certain circles, that's actually a badge of honor. Yeah. yeah. Well, what about Michael Bloomberg for 12 years, mayor of New York City? And by most accounts, people I know in New York think he was an excellent mayor, did a good job. And he's a billionaire, Bloomberg Media. Uh -huh. I mean, if, if he, Rosemary, if, if he is serious and says he wants to get in, he, like Donald Trump, he can write his own checks. And Absolutely. I mean, he's, he's a billionaire on the other side, on the, for the other party. He's a big ego guy. Um, and if he says that he sees a path, um, I, I would take him seriously. And, and you know how I think it could shake out, I don't know, is that if Trump doesn't get the nomination, he's going to find a flaw in that contract he signed and run as an independent. <laughs> and then on the Democratic side, if you have Bloomberg run as an independent, you have four you know, big personalities and uh, wow, anything goes. But Michael, I think this is a trend you're going to see more often, is people who have not held elected office before or people that are coming from outside the political system. Yeah. The first political job Michael Bloomberg had was mayor of New York City. He didn't really, was he wasn't right. on the city council. Mm -hmm. right. And Donald Trump's never held elective office. He's the front runner in the Republican Party right now. Right. I think we're going to start to see this a lot more over the next 10 or 20 years. People who haven't held office before, running for Congress, right. running for governor, Rick Scott, and never held elected office and, and, until and, he ran And for Rick governor. Scott, uh, in the op-ed that he wrote for USA Today, for basically endorsing Trump was, look, outsiders like me, you know, can do the job. You don't have to have been in government. But the fact of the matter is, H.T., I mean, when you go to court and you are arguing a case before an experienced judge, I mean, experience counts. Yeah, experience does count. But when you talk about the legislative process, there's a big argument, if reading the Federalist Papers, that our founders really wanted citizen legislators. They did not necessarily right. want legislators to have this as a job for life. Right. But for judges, now that's a totally different construct. Mm -hmm. We want to have judges that have the number one criteria is wisdom and judgment. And so we want experienced people to have wisdom and judgment. I always tell my students that raw intelligence is way overrated. You give me somebody with judgment and experience and, I'll ta and hard work ethic, I'll take that any day. Yeah. But experience counts. Well, it, it does. It does indeed. Uh, before we run out of time, I want to show a little video of what uh, we experienced in Miami-Dade County this week uh, when several hundred motorcyclists and bikers and dirt bike drivers, here they were driving down some streets. Uh, Justin, you were in Tallahassee. You didn't. Here's what we all experienced. These guys forming up and, and really kind of terrorizing drivers on the streets of Miami and Miami-Dade and H.T. Smith, they allegedly, this was in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King. It happened on Monday, MLK Day. Here, watch this particular motorcyclist. He kicks a car that didn't show them proper respect. I mean, this is really, in many ways, outrageous. I yeah, mean, Dr. What, King what, would have what is, What's outrageous is the pathetic excuse of using Dr. King's legacy uh, for this hooliganism type conduct. Dr. King was about sacrifice, service, and selflessness. This is hooliganism. This is selfish. And this is placing the lives and the property of our citizens in danger. Uh, let's not give this much, uh, much consideration as any kind of legitimate argument. Right. And the police uh, in Broward, the BSO, and others were not prepared for it. Let's hope they are next year. Well, we That's are right. out of time. Justin, oh. Rosemary, HT, great to have you come in. Sorry we didn't get to the uh, memorial health care system, but I know you'll be editorializing on it, keeping an eye you on You bet. It. All right, still to come, a look at the demolition of a legendary drug dealer's home, and then later, my personal perspective about that politician who did the right thing when it comes to guns on college campuses. The Colombian drug kingpin, uh, kingpin, Pablo Escobar, once lived in a mansion on Miami Beach back in the 1980s. He died in 1993, but myths about that house have lived on. Rumors that he had cash 
cocaine, other valuables behind the walls, beneath the floor, even buried in the foundation. The new owners of that property wanted to find out what was hidden, if anything, before they demolished the house. Our Glenn and Milberg stopped by to see what they found. The end of an era has rightfully come to an end. Jim Shedd was DEA when Pablo Escobar paid cash for this home on North Bay Road, already a cocaine billionaire manipulating the Colombian government and the illicit U.S. drug trade. In 1980, he wasn't really big on anybody's radar. But it, it shows how much of a strategic thinker he was. The loads used to fly into the Bahamas and then go fast boats were bringing it to Miami. What, what better place? All this property and named the name of Escobar. Mark Schnapp was one of the U.S. attorneys involved in Escobar's eventual indictment and his South Florida home seizures. He remembers the cocaine crowds living large in the clubs and Escobar's reach. It was extremely long and deep and violent. I mean, uh, he actually blew up the equivalent of the FBI headquarters in um, Colombia. Both were there to watch history. As demolition began, the owners here hired treasure hunters to unearth any spoils Escobar was known to hide. So far, they found this bag of powder, some believe it's degraded cocaine, and they talk of a now stolen cylindrical safe. A lot of people have asked me, why don't you keep the house and make it into a museum and all this? I don't think we want to celebrate the criminals. Tearing down the house may not tear down Pablo Escobar's near mythic reputation. We're still talking about him. When did he die? In December 93. And we're still, he's still attracting attention. That was Glenna Melberg reporting, and we have posted a slideshow of some pictures that she took inside the Escobar home before it was demolished. You can see those photos on our website, local10.com. All right, still to come, my personal perspective about guns on campus. The Florida House said yes, but a powerful and courageous state senator said no. A chilly Sunday so far, and can you believe these are the current temperatures out there? We have lots of sunshine, but these temperatures have not warmed up much. Still in those mid to upper 50s, 62 in Key West, winds out of the north northwest, anywhere between 10 to up to 15 miles per hour. It could get a little breezy at times, especially on the coast, uh, on satellite. Uh, just a few clouds offshore, but that's about it. Here's a look nationwide. The next storm we'll be tracking is this right here and taking a look at your seven day forecast. We will be seeing uh, temperatures warming back up into those 70s starting tomorrow, but tomorrow morning where the sweaters rain chance goes up again starting Wednesday, Thursday. Looks like we'll be having another cold front coming through. Michael. Jennifer, thanks. All right, before we leave you this morning, a personal perspective about a politician who did the right thing. Yes, it does happen once in a while. We make a big deal of it when they don't do the right thing. So some words in praise of State Senator Miguel Diaz de la Portilla, who showed this week guts and leadership in Tallahassee. Diaz de la Portilla is a Republican from Miami. He chairs the Senate Judiciary Committee. On Thursday, that committee met to discuss the campus carry bill. The senator shot it down, as it were. We're talking about a bill that would have let people who have concealed weapons permits keep their guns on state college and university campuses. A perfectly terrible idea, and Miguel said so, killing the bill. Here is precisely what he said, quote, I don't think this is a Second Amendment issue. I think that what we are talking about here is campus safety. And the best way to address that issue and whether the proposed cure is worse than the disease. Oh, yeah, the cure would have been worse than the disease. How true. Guns on campus, awful. More power to Senator Diaz de la Portilla for standing up for common sense and campus safety. Again, we tell you when politicians screw up, sometimes we need to say thank you when they don't. So, Miguel, thank you very much. That's my perspective for this week. I hope you have a great Sunday. Remember, as always, stay informed, get involved. And what do you think about it all? We invite you to weigh in on any topic like uh, we have discussed this morning on email, Facebook, Twitter. Any of the addresses you see, we're easy to find, and we will write you back. Have a great Sunday.